What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Welcome to Saturday. Glad you made it out again. Checking us out, talking about Ham Radio. Boy, do we have a fun episode today. So this is the, the Patron Picks episode. Normally, our Patron episode goes live the first Saturday of the month. And the vote, the vote that made it was talking about ham radio satellites. And I'm no expert in that area at all. So I said, we got to get an expert. And we got him. Sean Kutzko is joining us today. A wealth of knowledge. And I'm already really jazzed about this. And we haven't even gone into the, any of the questions. So I'm uh, super excited that you made it out here to the ham radio crash course. Thanks again for joining me. We're also watching the chat room, so we'll we'll try and take questions as we go. I do have a Zoom going, and I may uh, may pop it up depending if we have time at the end. But if we don't, we always have our Discord after chat. So if you're not on the Discord, consider joining us now. All right, everybody, how's it going? Thanks for coming on out to the Hammerino Crash Course. I am Josh Ki6NAZ. Big weekend. We got uh, Jamboree's on the air this weekend, which uh, I'm excited about because I'm going to do a little video with Ben. Benjamin is now in Cub Scouts, my oldest son. We were actually on the air earlier. I was giving him a little bit of tutorial on how we're going to run that. So, you know, tomorrow I will likely be monitoring uh, Jamboree's on the air. And, and particularly for those of you that are interested, I'm going to be on the I'll be listening to the calling frequency, which is going to likely be 14.290. So if you're, um, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, hop on. We would, uh, we'd like to make a contact with you. And again, thanks for joining us. Who do we have? Let's see. I think your mic is peaking a bit. Hey, thank you. I will adjust that accordingly. Thank you. I've been playing around with some mic settings, and of course, that's what happens, right? Uh, another shout out here to the uh, hamtactical.com website that my wife. My wife is putting together all our different uh, ham radio fun stuff. Again, <laughs> it needs repeating because it's so funny. Appliance Operators Local FN51 is the, the shirt that we just put out. Uh, <laughs> I so much love that thing. So anyway, it's now in uh, sweaters and tumblers and mugs and all that fun stuff. And you can check it out at hamtactical.com. So who do we got in the chat? I saw Sterling in the house. I saw Jason, Ham Radio 2.0. Somebody just said, what did they say? Just got my tech this week. Thanks for all the education you give us. Satellites rock. I agree, and we're going to learn a lot more about that. Uh, the Flying Squirrel with a super chat. Hey, Josh, got my 705 and set it up today with my soda beam tri-band dipole. Barely know what a volt is, but hearing guys from Pacifico Mountain and Tokyo. Wow, thanks for all the advice and videos. Wow, that's awesome. My audio is clipping, 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 clipping. Hopefully it's better. Refresh if, if I'm uh, sounding odd. Let's see. Before you loop, you had attached the 705. Yeah, we'll talk about the loop I had um, on the 705 on another video. But it is a arrow antenna direction finding loop. And you can use it to track down RFI in your house. Well, you know how I like to do these. I don't like to leave uh, the guest waiting in the wings. So who we're talking to today? Well, today we are talking to Sean Kutzko, KX9X. Sean is pretty much the expert in the in the space or, or one of the experts ham radio is a very big community uh radio satellites and that's what we're going to be talking about there are links to a lot of things that sean has put out in the description so make sure to go check those out he's got on all bands it's uh a I, i'll ask him for clarification but i believe it's yeah it is a blog that he's doing with dx engineering he has this uh amsat field day link uh for a story of, of what he did so make sure to check that out and he's got some links to AMSAT as well that we'll, we'll be talking about soon. But without further ado, I'm just going to bring Sean in. So, Sean, how are you doing today? I am doing great, Josh. How's it going? Very good. Thanks for joining us. I, I want to just throw it to you, kind of introduce yourself, talk about what you've been up to, because you've been up to a lot. Uh, I follow you on Twitter. And, and by the way, Sean's Twitter handle is, is right there under his name, so make sure you, you, you add him, because that's where you're most active, right? That's correct. Uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the big satellite operators are most active on Twitter, uh, so I've I've gravitated towards that platform. 
Twitter is is actually a really nice spot if you stay within the ham radio realm. I've noticed. Yeah. Twitter can sometimes be, I would say toxic is a word I would use in some cases, but the ham radio space on Twitter has been really great. And I started getting uh, people following me in, in what I would call the ham radio satellite Twitter. And they're really cool. They're very active people. They're extremely active. They're extremely knowledgeable and they're very friendly. Uh, I've made a lot of uh, great uh, connections and friends uh, on Twitter all through the uh, the ham radio satellite community. That's awesome. So what yep. what... What brought you to ham radio? How long you been a ham? What what made you kind of dive deep in satellites? Oh, good grief. Okay. <laughs> How uh, much time you got? <laughs> the, the Reader's Digest version. Okay. Uh, I started um, AM broadcast band DXing when I was four. Uh, graduated to shortwave radio when I was about seven. Uh, got my first ham radio license when I was 13. I was active on CB before that. Um, but uh, back then you had to pass a Morse code test to get your license. I was first licensed in uh, 1982. And uh, you, had to, you had to send Morse code and, and, and uh, receive Morse code to get a novice class license. And that intimidated me when I was a young kid. So I thought I'd be happy with CB, but I found out that I really wanted to talk to people around the world. So I bit the bullet and learned the code and got my first license when I was uh, 13. That so, is fantastic. Your path to radio was the same as mine. Uh, awesome. I started out with AM, you know, DXing and, and shortwave listening. I never mm -hmm. got the C, uh, the CB bug. I, I like CBs. I, I've always kind of had one around. But um, mm -hmm. the, the the trying to pick up those far off stations was kind of always my jam. Yep. So that was yeah. Um, so what do you what do you do now? Um, satellites. How'd you get into satellites? Uh, so, you know, I, I, I went a traditional route. I was very interested in HF operating and got very uh, into uh, HF contesting uh, mm -hmm. when I was uh, a, a newer ham. Uh, got pretty good at that. Got bit by the DX bug by a, a fellow ham radio operator here in central Illinois. And and we, we did contesting and DXing pretty heavy for a long time and uh, ended up in the early 2000s with a 70-foot tower and a couple of tri-banders on it and antennas for VHF, UHF, and the low bands and, and was doing everything that I possibly could on HF. And then I got divorced and I had to take all that stuff down and I moved into an apartment. And soon mm -hmm. after that, I ended up on the East Coast working at ARRL running the contest branch. And I didn't have the ability to have a tower or a long, a long uh, uh, dipole outside of the apartment. So I needed to find other ways to enjoy ham radio. And that's when I started gravitating towards uh, portable operating, uh, QRP operating, smaller stations, minimalist stations. And uh, that all of that really, really intrigued me. And uh, the, the, the way of the way I was pursuing ham radio, going with the minimalist route, uh, bled over into my real life, and I became uh, uh, pretty much a minimalist in in all areas of my life mm -hmm. at this point. I got into satellites because it was portable. You know, I could uh, I could get uh, a handheld Yagi, and at first I was using a dual band HT, and I could go set up in my parking lot, and I could work stuff hundreds or a couple thousand miles away. And uh, being an old school HFDXer, that portion of satellite operating appeals to me very, very much. Right, because with satellites, you're taking something that's traditionally line of sight, and you're you're getting many hundreds, if not you know a thousand miles, capable in some cases, right? Right. Well, technically, it's still line of sight. It's just that the line of sight right. is 500 kilometers above you. That's right. We got yeah. Ray Novak in the house. He says hi. By the way, I just saw. Hey, him Ray, pop how up. you doing? Yeah. Uh, you know, my wife, you, you mentioned QRP. She says QRPs for heroes. That was something that came out of our podcast uh, because mm -hmm. of the the emphasis on, on having a small station, obviously less power, right? It's really important to kind of get all your kit in line to be successful. Mm -hmm. I've always found that you get you learn a lot from, from doing QRP. It, it's not always the best place to start, but you, you learn a lot no. if you do no. go that route. Yeah, I would not recommend uh, folks start off their ham radio <laughs> adventures doing QRP. Uh, but at, on, the, uh, on, the, on a similar note, um, I think QRP gets a, a really bad rap because um, five watts, uh, especially if you're using uh, CW or, the, uh, or some of the digital modes, five watts into a resonant half-wave dipole will perform really, really well. Now, you know, it's not going to perform as good as a kilowatt station with a six-element tri-bander at 90 feet. Uh, but you'll be surprised what you can work. I mean, um, uh, you know, uh, I've worked uh, in various locations throughout the United States, but using um, simple, uh, a simple five watt radio and uh, a resonant half wave dipole, I've worked almost 200 countries on HF. 
Wow. That's yeah. awesome. That's yep. fantastic. Break down, if you could, kind of what satellite operation is. And, and again, I, I, I'll just state it up front and, then, and feel free to dive in. One of the reasons why I think it's such an interesting thing for people to think about is you can do this the moment you get your technician license. Absolutely. It is a fantastic place to get started for people that are new to the hobby. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's I don't think it's a lot of money out up front necessarily to get started with it. So kind of if you could, what's the state of the nation of, of satellite amateur radio use today? Uh, I would say that uh, amateur radio satellite usage right now is probably the highest it's been in quite a long time. Um, all of the satellites that are currently in orbit that uh, you can make contacts through, there are plenty of satellites where you can just download data from. And those are, you know, those are very valuable, uh, especially to the people who launch those satellites and need that data for their projects. Sure, you know, sure. a lot of them are related to universities or whatnot. But um, the satellites that you can actually make contacts through, all of them are low Earth orbit at this point. So um, what that means is uh, the satellite is only going to be overhead for about 15 to 20 minutes at a shot. Um, and all of them, with one notable exception, all of them uh, use a combination of two meters or and 70 centimeters uh, to uh, communicate through the satellite. So uh, really with uh, a couple of uh, a couple of dual band HTs or um, uh, a couple of uh, uh, a couple of uh, like all mode uh, DC to daylight radios like the 706 or the the um, the 817 or something like that. Uh, you can be making satellite QSOs with uh, relatively, relatively modest antennas or uh, one of those handheld Yagi's that uh, you see a lot of satellite operators use. So it's extremely accessible. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a uh, it's pretty fast paced because a satellite pass, like I said, only lasts for about 15 minutes or so uh, maximum. Mm -hmm. So uh, you get a, you get a little bit of a, of a thrill of uh, the excitement uh, because everybody's trying to talk to everybody real fast. Contacts are pretty short, uh, and um, it, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's it's a high energy way to enjoy ham radio in short periods of time. Well, yeah, let's. That's perfect. Let's dive into that a little bit because I've seen mm -hmm. the videos of people that hold their, you know, they got their video of a bow fang. They're holding it sideways and they make a contact. Right. right. Is, that, is that pretty rare? Yeah. Is that hard to do? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, I mean, uh, there are there are plenty of people out there who have made satellite contacts using uh, a really long uh, whip antenna off of their HT. Mm -hmm. You can do it. Um, I don't think very many uh, beginners are going to be able to pull that off because it requires a, a lot of skill and knowledge of how the satellite uh, path is is uh, making it to you, uh, understanding uh, the orbits, understanding uh, a lot of other technical aspects to it. So, um, I would I would strongly suggest that uh, a beginner use a, a much larger antenna that provides you a little bit more gain than uh, than an extendable whip will. Um, you know, once you get uh, once you get your sea legs, so to speak, or your space legs, I guess is the case. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. uh, you can certainly experiment with uh, with using smaller antennas and really really small stations to to make contacts. But I wouldn't recommend you start off that way. Right. So basically what we're talking about to kind of break it down a little bit for people is the satellites are running, they're like dual band repeaters, right? So you, yep. the, the FM satellites are, are pretty much an orbiting repeater. Only one person can access it at a time. Uh, there's an effect uh, on frequency modulation that uh, you've ex everybody's experienced with their car stereo called the capture effect, right. which is the loudest station makes it into your receiver and locks onto uh, to that signal. So if... Uh, if you're the loudest signal out there and you hit the satellite first, you're the one that's going to be heard. So um, if uh, uh, you know, it's there's there, there's there's a lot of people who are trying to access the satellite simultaneously, um, but uh, the stronger signal is the one that's going to be heard first. Right. So your antenna wise, so just kind of let's throw this out to what people might want to look at if they're getting started. It sounds like dual band. So VHF, UHF. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you can homebrew. Um, or there's a couple of, you know, off the shelf antennas, so to speak, to get started. Right. And what do you use? What have you used? What do you recommend? So if you're interested in homebrewing antennas, um, AMSAT has a link to uh, a, a several antenna plans uh, by uh, WA5VJB, Victor Juliet Bravo. 
uh, and he has a whole series of cheap yagis. That's what he calls them. And uh, they're, okay. they're great homebrew projects. They're not too difficult and they perform really, really well. So if you're interested in homebrewing your antennas, I would recommend you check out the, the, the WA5VJB cheap yagis for satellites. Those are great. Um, if you want something off the shelf, um, the two big contenders uh, on, the, uh, on the commercially available antennas for satellites at this point uh, for handheld stuff, are the Aero antenna, which is uh, so okay. So there's the Aero antenna and there's the Elk antenna. Mm -hmm. So the Aero antenna is uh, a handheld dual band Yagi. It's three elements on two meters and seven elements on seventy centimeters, and uh, they're in a cross polarized position. I see you got it brought up on the screen yep. there. So thanks for that. I'm following along, <laughs> right on. Doing my job. Um, here. And then uh, uh, those work exceptionally well. Uh, they're extremely popular. Uh, and then, uh, and you can use those, you can use, you can use the, uh, the arrows with either, uh, two HTs. You can use them with a, a single HT that, um, uh, does two meters and, uh, 70 centimeters simultaneously, a thing that we need to get into called full duplex operating. Oh yeah. Um, and, uh, or you can use it with, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, DC to daylight rigs as well. They work exceptionally well. They're very portable. They're very light. They, they're, they're good performers. The other antenna that's very popular is the elk antenna, which is a uh, five element log periodic uh, on a single boom and it has a single feed line. And uh, I know plenty of satellite operators that use the elk as, wet, as well. I frequently get asked uh, uh, which antenna is better, the elk or the arrow. And it's, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's really a, a Coke versus Pepsi kind of argument. Sure. There's there's matters of personal taste, personal preference. Um, there's some, uh, you know, there's some aesthetics, you know, the, 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 the elk antenna is a little bit easier to, to transport in your car in one piece, for example, that may appeal to some people more than others. Um, but both antennas are rock solid performers and, and anybody getting started would do well with either one of them. With the elk, I noticed uh, you can hold it differently, right? You can kind of balance it a little bit differently than the arrow. The arrow is kind of out in front of you. I mean, you're, there's ways of kind of using it correctly, right. but it's a... It's really a choose your own adventure kind of thing. There's really not Absolutely. a wrong answer there, in this there, space. There really is no wrong answer in this. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, some people are going to prefer uh, the elk because it's a little bit more compact. Uh, the log periodic design uh, doesn't require that you use um, a, a device called a diplexer, which splits right. your two meter and 70 centimeter signal. Uh, and we'll, we can get into that. That's that's fairly important to know mm -hmm. that as well. Um, but honestly, um, you know, I've been using an elk antenna since 2000. 12 and now i'm still using the same antenna that i bought back then and uh, you know, elk or arrow i'm sorry arrow i apologize okay. arrow uh i've been using the same arrow uh since 2012 and it's you know it's pretty beat up but uh it still works great and it's both of these are something that you buy it let's call it you buy it once and assuming you treat it okay it's going right. to last you a really long time long what's, what's time. the price range for a lot of these antennas i'm looking at 130 bucks about maybe about 130 to 170 depending on a couple of bells and whistles that you may want to buy but that's uh you know for uh for a solid piece of kit uh that is uh that is a very reasonable price i mean if you you know if you parse mine out over the years that i've used it it's cost me about 15 bucks a year mm -hmm. so you've got your you've got your radio Maybe, maybe let's let's start with the the simple approach to it. I guess you would say an arrow antenna or an elk, two feed mm -hmm. points. Maybe you're using two inexpensive handhelds. Yep. Would that be a They're cheap way to get started? Completely inexpensive way to get involved. There are many, many, many satellite operators who got started using Baofangs. Uh, sure. You know there are uh, there are plenty of other radios out there uh, that I would recommend that are going to be you know more solid performers. But uh, if you're looking to get started on a budget, there's nothing wrong with getting started that way. You will find um, that other radios will be better performers for you. Mm -hmm. So when you get a little bit more experience under your belt, I would strongly recommend graduating to a, a more solid radio. And I see uh, we got Katie Allen in the house, WY7YL. <laughs> so she's hey, in the hey. chat saying hi. Spacecom's in here too, so very good. Spacecom's great, great YouTube channel as well. What's going on, guys? So you Thanks got for, uh, 
Thanks for showing up, everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All, we got all the, the ham radio satellite Twitter community is in the chat right now. So thank you, everybody, for coming out and, and supporting Sean. Because, yeah, I'm a, tough, I'm a tough interviewer. I was going to you know, beat him up a little bit. But since you guys are here, I'll, I'll, I'll go good on him and <laughs> go nice. <laughs> so you got Checks in the mail, everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> so you got, uh, you, got, you got your antenna. You got maybe a couple of radios or maybe one radio. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. What do people need to know before they kind of step out of their door to go make a contact on a satellite because you said it's fast paced i think you got to do a little bit of homework right yeah i would i would so i would strongly recommend that if you're interested in getting involved with satellite operating you you know what's the 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 standard rule that we all heard from uh from our elmers or from folks in our local club or wherever you may have heard it you know the standard rule of ham radio is listen 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 so i would strongly suggest that if you're taking your first steps in satellite operating just um excuse me, just uh, spend, just focus your time at first on listening and make sure that you can hear satellites as they're going overhead. Because if you can't hear them, you're not gonna be able to talk through them. So make sure that your ability to receive various satellites is rock solid before you start worrying about transmitting. And that gets into um, the, what I would say is the cardinal rule of satellite operating, which oh. is okay. do not transmit if you cannot hear the satellite because this happens several times a year where somebody who is brand new getting involved with satellite operating will start uh transmitting on the air and you know trying to hear themselves through the satellite and they'll give their call sign a lot of times or they'll say hello hello hola hola that kind of stuff and they don't realize that they're actually making it into the satellite they just can't hear themselves yet Right. And that causes, you know, that causes unintentional interference to a lot of people who are able to hear themselves on the satellite. Mm -hmm. It's an innocent mistake. They, you know, you, you don't mean to do that, but it can create real problems during a satellite pass. So please, please, please do not transmit if you cannot hear the satellite. Okay. Yes. Yes, indeed. And that's also part of the DX code of contact duct, I believe, too, is basically don't mm -hmm. don't start calling until you actually can hear back. Yeah. somebody to make a contact with right because you, you really don't want to be that guy you really don't. right and and it, i'm assuming if you throw your call sign out there people are going to know who you are right it's not like they can't say like hey yeah. bro <laughs> hey chill yeah. relax <laughs> on the ptt a little bit yeah yeah don't please you know don't be that guy please yeah so you you get all set up you got your gear um we skipped probably over an important part is how does people how do people best find out when there is a pass coming or or you know uh, what, yeah. what do you do let let's just model the the expert what do, what do you do when you're getting ready to to you know do a pass maybe maybe a casual pass maybe your your casual pass would be like some people's first time passes kind of thing what do you sure. do Sure. Okay. So the first thing you need to know is when is a satellite going to be over my horizon so I can talk through it. Right. Um, and in order to know that, there are uh, a few different avenues that you can go through. Um, the AMSAT website, AMSAT stands for the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, and they are the primary organization uh, that is uh, getting satellites launched from here in the United States, uh, and they are the primary organization for uh, providing information and engineering support for the satellites that are uh, already up there. So if you are interested in satellite operating, I strongly recommend that you go to AMSAT's website. It's amsat.org. One of the many, many pages of information they have there is um, a link to um, a satellite pass predictor program. And you can punch in uh, the name of a couple of satellites that you're interested in, and it will give you a graphic display of when those satellites are going to be in uh, over over your uh, neck of the woods and when they're going to be visible visible above your horizon. So amsat.org, that you know they've got a, a great interface for that. Um, there's a website that you can go to uh, called uh, n2yo.com, november2yankeeoscar.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you can uh, punch in uh, the name of a satellite that you want to track, and it will uh, show you uh, real-time satellite information uh, with uh, a, a map display, where the satellite is, uh, who's going to be able to talk to it in real time. Uh, it's, a, it's a great website to, to check out for that. But the most convenient way that I've found to keep track of satellite passes is to download uh, an app on your smartphone. Um, 
I I live in uh, the Apple universe, so I'm familiar most familiar with Apple products. So um, there are a couple of uh, apps that I think are worth checking out if you're on a budget. Uh, there's an app called SatSat that is uh, worth checking out. That's S A T S A T. That will give you a very basic listing of satellites that are going to be uh, over your horizon and uh, when you're going to be able to talk through them. Uh, if you're willing to spend money for a premium app, uh, there's an app that I use called GoSat Watch. And I find that to be a, a very superior product. I've been using that for a few years now. Uh, it's, it's expensive as apps go. It's, uh, it's about 10 bucks, uh, but it's a one-time fee. And uh, it, it provides great information on uh, when the satellites are going to be available. It provides a good graphic display of where the satellite is in real time uh, over your horizon. Uh, it provides uh, a, um, a, a view of all of the satellites that are over your horizon simultaneously, and it automatically updates what are called the Keplerian elements, which are the elements of the orbit itself, which change over over the course of time and need to be um, recalculated and uh, and updated and put back into your app. So Satellites you drift. A, Satellites they drift. They certainly do. <laughs> yes. They certainly do. So uh, making sure that uh, those elements are up to date uh, is a critical component of knowing when a satellite is going to be overhead because uh, you know your the your tracking program is only as good as the data that you feed it. So um, GoSat Watch autom uh, automatically updates that information. Um, again, you know there are there are plenty of apps out there. Uh, I know that there are a couple of apps for the Android world. Uh, mm -hmm. AMSAT uh, AMSAT Droid is a I believe that's a free app that you can uh, that you can download on your Android. Um, there's also uh, an app for Android by the uh, folks who run the Heavens Above website. Yes, and they provide uh, a bunch of satellite tracking information free as well. So I've captured a lot of those links. So anybody that's interested, oh good, Sean gave me a ton of links. They're already in the description ready to go so anybody that's interested a lot of what he pointed to at amsat a lot of what i i glossed over really quickly on the opening is all in the description so you can find them you know directly to get people going but that's a really important part because you do need to follow the satellites your your activation of said satellite requires it to be you know somewhere overhead right that's that's the it's most important it's very part. difficult to access a satellite if it's not above your horizon right right which is always a funny thing um we won't go down this topic, but I always talk about satellites, ham satellites, and uh, the flat Earth theory. <laughs> as far as the Earth being round, I use that as a as a very good example of, of why such a thing is the thing, uh, right. <laughs> as it were. All right, so you got your gear, you you got an antenna, you got a couple of handy talkies. You know when a pass is coming. You step outside, and what do you do? Well, you turn on your radio and hope for good, the best. Good place to start. Good place to start. Oh. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, there are a couple of there are a couple of things that are really critical to keep in mind uh, when you're first getting into satellites. Um, where you set up is really really important because um, you want to make sure that you have as clear an access to your horizon as you can possibly get. Um, if you live like like here in central Illinois. Um, in my backyard, I've got a wall of trees uh, that are pretty tall to my east, and trees can uh, absorb VHF UHF frequencies, especially 70 centimeters. So uh, if you live in an area with a bunch of trees that are uh, close by, you're probably not going to do too well uh, uh, with uh, your, your 70 centimeter signal, whether that's your transmit signal or your receive signal, depending mm -hmm. on which satellite you're trying to access, you will either transmit or receive on 70 centimeters. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that, uh, you know, the big selling points about using uh, this satellite gear is that it's extremely portable. So, you know, I've got a, uh, I've got a very large open field that's just a couple of blocks from where I live. And if I wanna make sure that I do well on a satellite pass using my, my aero antenna and portable gear, I will go to that field because uh, it's got a much better view of the horizon than my backyard does. So, right. um, you know, the ideal spot to do a satellite pass is on top of a very high hill uh, with no trees to be found anywhere. That's the most ideal spot. Um, if you live in an urban environment and, you know, there's there's no hope of getting past those skyscrapers that uh, you live around, see if you can get access to the top floor of a parking garage. Oh, okay. Um, that's that's a good option. I, I used that when I was uh, I used that when I was in London in 2018, and it worked mm -hmm. very very well. So um, 
So, you know, if if you if you can't get access to an open field with a clear shot of the horizon, aim for uh, increasing your elevation as much as you possibly can to get over those obstacles. So that's mm -hmm. that's the first thing that I would uh, consider. Uh, the second thing is to make sure that uh, you have your radios tuned properly. Uh, that may sound like a silly thing to say, but um, there's this funny thing called the Doppler effect involved uh, with satellites. And um, the Doppler effect is, uh, is uh, an important aspect to consider when using satellites because you're trying to communicate through a hunk of metal that's a moving target. And everybody's heard, you know, everybody's seen the videos of the train as it goes by, you know, and as it yeah. goes away, the, the pitch of the, of the whistle decreases. And um, that's, uh, that happens with satellites too. As a satellite is, is coming closer to where you are on earth, uh, the frequency is going to be higher. Uh, the, the, the seven, your 70 centimeter frequency is going to be a little bit higher. Now, what does that mean? That means that um, I'm trying not to get too far deep into the weeds here, but basically um, uh, you need to count, you need to adjust your 70 centimeter frequency a little bit to compensate for the Doppler effect, which is going to be a little bit higher or a little bit lower at the beginning of the pass. Uh, and you need to, uh, you need to make sure that your transmit frequency and your receive frequency are dialed in. Um, how do you know when you are dialed in properly. Let's assume for sake of argument that the satellite is, you know, reasonably high overhead. Uh, you've got a clear signal. You can hear uh, other stations communicating through it and you want to, you want to send out that call. How do you, how do you know when you're making it through? Mm -hmm. This is why um, what we call full duplex operating is incredibly important because full duplex operating means that you can, uh, he, you can transmit into the satellite and receive the satellite simultaneously in real time. If you're using an HT, if you're using a single HT, that is what we call half duplex. When you transmit, there's, you don't have any received audio whatsoever. Right. Uh, and most, you know, that's how most H HTs function. But if you transmit and you can't hear yourself through the downlink, you don't have any frame of reference as to whether or not your signal is actually making it into the satellite or not. So you can be transmitting and somebody with a louder signal may, uh, may get uh, into the satellite first and you would have no way of knowing whether you made it in or not. Yeah. So being able to listen to the downlink simultaneously as you are transmitting is a huge advantage, especially for a beginning satellite operator to know whether or not you're making it into the system. You you've got really good point there, and let let's let's break that down a little bit. So you got a walkie-talkie effect. If I'm on mm -hmm. two meters and I'm talking to somebody on two meters, when I talk, I'm not hearing two meters on the walkie-talkie because you know the radio you'd, you'd blow up the front end on the receive side if you did that. Mm -hmm. These satellites are are seventy centimeters downlink, for example. Sometimes they're flipped. And right. they transmit on the opposite frequency. Why right. we said two handy talkies is that one would be on the downlink frequency, 70 centimeters, for example, and the other one would be on the two meters, the transmit frequency. So you're listening with one handy talkie while talking into the other handy talkie. And that's correct. That's what you're trying to get is that constant information coming in from the downlink of the satellite to make sure that you're making it right. Absolutely. That is that you just, you hit the nail on the head. Um, so um, one of uh, one of my colleagues uh, who's in the chat, uh, Doug N6UA, a veteran satellite operator and a large, uh, uh, a big portable operator as well. He made uh, he made a very good point in the chat, which is um, I saw that. when you're when you're using um, when you're using a full duplex system like this, where you can hear the transmitted audio coming through the satellite as you are talking, make mm -hmm. sure that you wear a uh, headphones or an earbud because mm -hmm. you can create a feedback loop uh, with the receive audio going into your microphone as you are transmitting. And that will go out over the satellite and nobody likes hearing feedback on a satellite. In, indeed, yes. And, and <laughs> I, I guess you could probably go a step further and say, I'm, I'm assuming you're using uh, headphones of some kind, regardless of yes. which radio you use. Uh, generally, uh, yes. that's a safe practice, I, I would assume for a lot of people. Uh, yes. Which we'll talk uh, about no. that because I've got a little display over here that I want to throw over to because okay. I want to get your thoughts on and, and kind of curious your gear. We're going to talk about that, too. Um, sure. All right. So you've you gone outside. You're uh, you've got your your software on your phone. You're looking at, you know, what what satellites you should be tracking. You've, you've got the gear, at least what you think you should should have. 
we're obviously talking about FM satellites at this point, right? Right. So Andy right. talking satellites. We're focusing satellites. on FM. Yep. Right now, we'll, we'll hopefully. How much time do you have, Sean? I think is the important question. <laughs> I can I can riff all night. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> you say that, but I'm going to have you join Discord, and you're going to join us in the after chat, and you're going to okay. be begging. We're going to be twisting your arm to stay. Uh, so let, I gotta go. Yeah, yeah. I, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> What what satellite should people be looking to to start out with? We've been talking FM, so mm -hmm. I'm assuming we're talking FM satellites. Yes, we're we're talking we're focusing this conversation right now solely on FM satellites. Um, so I would say for ease of use, uh, the satellite that I would recommend starting off with is called AO91. Uh, that is a satellite with a 70 centimeter uplink. So you transmit on 70 centimeters and you receive or downlink from the satellite on two meters. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in doing my uh, um, extensive preparation for this show, I did not um, include the, I, I did not memorize the frequencies for AO91. So let I, me I'm look pulling, I'm, I'm literally, I'm literally yeah. showing AMSAT's website while you're talking. Okay. So Thank uh, you. yeah, okay. don't, no, I got you, man. I so, got you. So, uh, so AO91, the 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 downlink frequency for AO91 is 145.960 megahertz, and uh, the uplink frequency is 435.250. So, if you're interested in listening for satellites, what I can uh, what I would recommend you do is uh, start off with AO91, uh, download a satellite tracking app, and uh, punch in AO91 on your favorite app. Find out when it's going to be overhead. Tune your two meter radio to 145,960. I think that's what I just said. Yeah, and Doug's uh, in the chat too. He's popping it in there for you okay, too. So awesome. Doug's got Thanks, your back Doug. as well. So good work, Doug. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> um, and uh, so Doug and I also share a, a, a very serious uh, passion in uh, baking serious breads and cookies and desserts. So I'll, I'll, I'll ship you some good baked goods, Doug. All right. Are you guys on TikTok? Are you guys on bread TikTok? Is it, have you heard about that? I don't that? think we are. No, I'm not. I don't know if he is or not. <laughs> but um, so uh, tune around, uh, listen for when AO91 is going to be a, above your horizon. Mm -hmm. Use your satellite app to um, uh, have it tell you, you know, how it's tracking in the sky. For example, you know, what part of the horizon right. is it going to come up over the horizon? Track it in real time as it goes over uh, overhead. And then follow it as it disappears down below the horizon again, and uh, and 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 start testing your abilities to uh, to hear the satellite well. Uh, AO91 it has a very loud signal. Uh, it's uh, it's got good coverage uh, over uh, uh, most passes. So if you uh, if you start off with AO91, you're 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 off to a good start. Yeah, I've got uh, N2YO right here looking at at. AO91 and, and anybody can pull this up and 2YO and you can just search for AO91 and there's a, a 10 day predictions link you can click on and it'll show you if you don't go the app route but I, I highly recommend the app route and I'll let you talk about it but the, the few activations I've done you know contacts I made I'm like looking at the screen going where the heck is this thing you know like yeah. literally pointing at, at the horizon line waiting for the for the satellite is that kind of what you do or something like that um, it it, it depends. Um, oftentimes what I will do is, you know, um, the, the satellite has a, a graphical display of, um, um, so the, the app that I use again is GoSat Watch. Um, there are lots of apps out there, but um, the uh, GoSat Watch will display a satellite's pass uh, with uh, a series of circles with uh, north, south, east, and west listed on a two-dimensional yeah. graph. And um, if I were smart, I would have taken a screenshot of this and I could have just had you show it right now. Yeah, um, and, and I should do this too. Really, this is my fault, not yours. <laughs> you're, you're the expert. You keep going. I'll try to work um, around so, it. <laughs> but anyway, it will show you how, it will show you in real time uh, where the satellite is relative to your position and how high up above the horizon it is all in real time. Mm -hmm. So you'll know that, you know, oh, four minutes mm -hmm. into the satellite, it will be pointed straight east for example i need right. to point my antenna straight east that's that this may seem like something that's very basic but uh it does i get this question every now and then um so when you're communicating with people through the satellite you want to make sure that your antenna is pointed at the satellite not at the person that you're trying to talk to it's not a direct line of sight you're using the satellite as an intermediary so oh, make yeah. sure that you're yeah, make sure you're pointing your antenna at the satellite itself. Like I said, that may seem very fundamental, but every now and then I get that question. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to pull up 
now my uh I'm trying to do the fast work here. See, this is always problematic when you're trying to start to scramble to do this live, but I, I can pipe my iPhone into the live stream. Oh, cool. So I'm going to cue you up with the next question while I while I try to fiddle around with that a little bit. So we covered, you, you now have a satellite. We're saying AO91 is probably a good place to start. You key that into your application. You've got an antenna that matches. you got your phone. What does a QSO sound like? Cause, because I've heard them, and you've actually sent an example, which we'll play here shortly. But it's different than your normal QSO. Yes. Um, so if you're if you're an HF operator or um, or a, a local repeater user, for example, um, you're probably used to having relatively um, calm, slow-paced, casual conversations. And the simple fact of the matter is that because the satellite is only overhead for 15 minutes at a time, it's an extremely valuable resource. And lots of people are trying to use this resource all at once, all in the span of 15 minutes. So contacts on satellites are generally very, very short. Um, what you will hear is people exchanging their call signs using, their, uh, using standard phonetics uh and uh exchanging um their uh their grid squares uh if uh, grid squares for those who don't know grid squares are um a geographic unit that is two degrees of longitude wide by one degree of latitude tall and um grid squares are are configured in a uh in groups of 100 and they are set up in a two letter two number format from and the number is from zero zero to nine nine so for example the grid square that the ARRL is in in central connecticut is grid square uh fn 31 fox nancy 31 so what you'll often hear is very fast paced uh contacts exchanging nothing more than their call sign and their 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 grid square that they're in um and and that you know your average your average uh contact on a satellite can take probably no more than 10 seconds 10 okay so good good note 10 seconds you're aiming to be brief again because you you've got a very right. fast pass that you're trying to cover right you know 14 you, minutes at the most but realistically what like 10 uh 10 on average uh okay. you know i mean if, if if you're interested in rag chewing um I, I I do have to say that uh, making satellite contacts, at least FM co uh, satellite contacts, is going to be a bit of an adjustment for you because there's just too many people trying to use it at once, and, uh, and for, you know, for the sake of everybody else who's trying to make a contact, uh, we try to be brief. Right, and and that's a, the, in a lot of ways, satellite contacts feel almost like contesting to me in in, in a that's, certain sense. That's a good analogy. That's, is you know, or, or, or if you're a DXer, it's like running a pileup. Right. You're, you're trying to be efficient. It, that's the point. You're trying to make a contact because, like you said, there's lots of people out there as well that are trying to make contacts. You're trying to, to focus on the efficiencies, right, in, in, right. in having the contact. That's correct. Because, again, um, oftentimes uh, on, on, uh, on any given FM pass, you could have, you know, um, you could have, you know, several dozen or, you know, 100, 150 people all trying to make a contact through the satellite mm -hmm. and, you know, do the math. If you if the satellite's only up above the horizon for 10 to 15 minutes at a time, that's mm -hmm. not a whole lot of time to make a contact. So this uh, is true. If, if you're interested in sharing the resource, um, brevity is uh, is the gentlemanly thing. to do. <laughs> Very good. Very nice. <laughs> Yeah. You know, okay. So we, we 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 have this hypothetical scenario. We've got two radios and a and a, a yagi of some kind. We we know the past. And we, let's say we made a couple of contacts, and we're thinking about how we might upgrade our modest portable station. And I and I think you will tell me, but I think there are uh, many options. I think to have a nice, you know, well equipped satellite FM satellite. Uh, kind of gear loadout and, and maybe mm -hmm. walk through what you use and what you would recommend to people um so if uh if you're looking at upgrading from say you know two bow fangs uh, uh yeah, for your station there, sure there are there are plenty of examples out there i mean any any uh uh any commercially available dual band ht by any of the major manufacturers will perform very very well um if you want to if, if you want to spend a little bit of money uh, or you are interested in looking at some used gear, you can find a, a full duplex HT, uh, one that will, uh, one that you can transmit on one band and receive on another band simultaneously, all in single HT. Um, the 
the Cadillac of that uh, style of, of uh, HT is the Kenwood uh, THD 72. This is a, a fantastic HT uh, that uh, unfortunately just became a discontinued item. But uh, this is um, this has uh, the, this has five watts on an HT. You can transmit and receive on two meters and 70 centimeters simultaneously. It's got built-in APRS, built-in GPS. I mean, this is a real workhorse uh, of an HT for satellite operating. This is, you know, for as far as HTs go, I would say this is probably the gold standard for uh, for satellite operators. But there are there are lots of HTs made by uh, all of the major manufacturers that uh, uh, are you know are are older that uh, have full duplex capability that uh, you should definitely uh, check out if you want to go the used equipment route. I'm if showing off buy... a little bit. I, I've oh, got okay. my D72. Oh, look at that. There you go. Yeah, right. I, I got a bunch of stuff in the mail, and so some of this stuff fell out, like this Homeland Security. I got an update to that one, so I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in another video. But my D72, and then I, um, I pipe in. I try and have an inline recorder. Do you do that? I sure do. As a matter of fact, um, several of the uh, more experienced uh, satellite operators there, when I was uh, when I was cutting my teeth and learning about all of this stuff, recommended um, recording passes uh, for ease of use. Because if you're out there standing in a field and you're doing a satellite pass and you've got you know you've got your HT in one hand mm -hmm. and you're holding your antenna in the other, how are you going to write this stuff down? Right. So uh, so they said, just record the pass and write it all down and upload it to Logbook of the World later. Mm -hmm. So um, the recommended uh, recording device that a lot of the uh, the big operators, the big satellite operators use is this uh, this device by Sony. It is the uh, uh, what is it here? I can't read it. Uh, the PX where to go? The PX 470. And you can get this on Amazon for like 30 bucks, I think. And um, Ooh, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a wonderful recorder. It records direct MP3 format. Uh, it's got um, a built-in uh, microphone. So if you're, if you're using the speaker on your HT for whatever reason, uh, you can just put it in your pocket and, and record direct over the air and it'll be fine. Uh, what I would recommend though, is getting um, a headphone splitter and tapping into the... Uh, uh, the headphone jack on your receive HT mm -hmm. and running one line to your headphones or your earbuds and running another line for uh, a line in jack on the uh, top of the PX 470 here. Sure. And what that does is that gives you an audio recording of what the satellite downlink sounds to you using your gear. Mm -hmm. And that is the perfect reference for how you are receiving a satellite uh, pass uh, because you're recording directly exactly what you're hearing coming off of your receiver. Right. And, um, uh, you know, because it's a line in, you don't have your, you know, the microphone on the unit isn't active. So you're not going to get extraneous noise from mm -hmm. uh, people who are, you know, who are passing by wondering what the heck you're doing, waving this big hunk of aluminum in the air and talking yep. to people, you know, so um, uh, so I would recommend doing that. Uh, and it, it, this, you know, this thing produces very very high quality recordings and then you can go back and you can listen to it later and transcribe all of the call signs that you work and put them in your logbook i guess if you think about it this way if, if you're if you're thinking about getting kind of not even serious about it but if you if you think you might have like three contacts in an evening or whatever in a pass mm -hmm. i definitely can't remember those call signs <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I would not be able to remember that and you no. would want the audio quality to be kind of like right out of the radio Right. right. You, you, I mean, you could put a camera on, but even then the camera is it's not going to be as, as good as if you're picking up directly yeah. off the audio source. So that, yeah, no, that's a really is, good pro. That's a pro tip. We call pro that a pro tip, tip. right here. Yeah. You know, you take the line in uh, approach on the on the recorder and patch directly out of your headphone audio and use a splitter so you can still hear what's going on. Yeah. There's another nice tip uh, that I would recommend to anybody who's recording satellite passes, and that is. Um, tag the recording at the very beginning with all the uh, information about the satellite pass that you are recording. For example, um, I'll often say something like um, sure. AO91 pass yes. on October 12th, 2020 at 1535 Zulu from my home grid square of EN50. Of course. And that way, at, right at the very beginning of the yes. pass, I've got all of the pertinent information of what that recording is about. That the it sounds so simple why did no one think of this before right, right <laughs> that that right. makes a lot of sense i i right. think i might have worked this out so hold on let me see if i did this right 
Okay. Uh, that's the wrong camera, but we are looking at my – so wrong camera, but we're looking at my iPhone right now. Okay. This is the pass. I grabbed SO50 because that was the only one that I had that had a decent pass uh, coming up. The mm -hmm. cool thing about that, that yellow line that you're seeing, that yellow line is the pass. So if you're aiming to the north, that's where the pass is going to begin and come over your head. Correct. Right? So that that's yep. kind of how I, I, I took that. Um, hold on, let me see if I can get rid of this. Right, and if you if you if you focus in on that graphic, I'm 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 looking here on my second monitor. If you if you focus in on that graphic uh, between north and east, basically on the northeast line, you will see that there is an arrow pointing down on that uh, yellow line, and that will right. tell you what direction the satellite is passing. Yeah, unfortunately, we're on my iPhone, so it's I'm I'm literally because what the really cool thing is is you can do horizon with this. So you can, when the pass is coming overhead, it's a compass. Mm -hmm. So I'm controlling this, and I can see where the pass is going to be. Yep. Um, that is a really cool feature with the GoSat watch. I don't know if the other ones do that. I don't know if SatSat does that. But um, that you'll see it. The, the bottom line here is the horizon line, and then all this darkness is, this, is the sky above. And you can track the satellite that way because you can literally orient. Okay, well, there's north, right? So now I know I'm, I'm pointing in the right direction. So mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, that that's an example of that. Yep. So very it's, good. To, okay. To me, to me, that's to me that app is just it's just worth the money. Is that it's it's ten dollars? I think somebody was saying in I the think chat. I think it's ten bucks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, chat for for that. I saw Christian Kudnick in the house. One hundred watts in a wire. He said hi. So thanks Zero for coming SGH. out. What's happening, man? And somebody mentioned, hey, doesn't the D seventy four record? And we're like, yes, but we're talking about the D seventy two. Unfortunately, that's correct. The, the D, and there's also another major consideration: the D seventy four does record, but the D seventy four is not a full duplex. Not HD. not full duplex. Yeah. All right. So just looking at handy talky, maybe you splurge because uh, I I think I think and let me actually I, I did pull up this website beforehand. Let me see if I've got this still. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's still there. Sorry, let me let me flip over here for a second. Uh, Ham Radio Outlet, I think, still has. Uh, yeah, they. Hey, Anaheim has it. Uh, so they still have some D72s in stock. Maybe mm -hmm. other manu uh, retailers do too. I don't know. I'm just pulling up the, uh, the Ham right, Radio I mean, Outlet. They, this is this is a discontinued item. So you know, right. there are not going to be any more of them. So if this is something that you are considering picking up, you better move fast. For everybody in the chat that's asking, doesn't this have full duplex? Doesn't this have full? Very few handy talkies actually have full duplex. The FT3DR right. does not. The D74 does not. The D72 does. And uh, last week when I was talking about like ham radios to look out for if you're starting out, there's a Wushan. Uh, I can't remember the model number. Somebody in the chat will tell me. The Wushan does full duplex. Have you played around with that one at all, Sean? Have you seen that? I have not. I have not. I, I I know a couple of people who have used them, and they seem very happy with them. But I have no personal experience with the Wushan. Yeah. So I mean, think about that. Remember, Sean, what what we're talking about right now is is going portable with this. You're going in. And in fact, this is a really good segue. I'll I'll do a segue for myself. Sean okay. sent me a, a series of pictures. So here here he is um, in what looks like a very snowy area. That is Yellowstone uh, Park, uh, and uh, I would like to acknowledge Katie WY7YL for taking that photo. Oh wow! And then you yeah. hear this looks like a parking garage. That is that is the roof of a parking garage in London. Uh, I'm I'm trying to uh, extend the the antenna a little bit closer to the satellite. Uh, that is um, wall. That is an event called Walmart Parking Lots oh, on the Air. That good. is we'll run have to by talk the satellite that. community, and uh, that is my local Walmart here in Central Illinois. Fantastic. This photo is of me uh, on the north shore of Puerto Rico in uh, November 2011, and I was working um, all sorts of stations in uh, in all across the United States from Puerto Rico on satellite. And I made the I made the collage too fast. That's my fault. <laughs> you don't have to try and hit all the images because we're already covering a lot of them. I apologize. Uh, yeah. Literally, we're going to have to have Sean out almost a second time for all of the details <laughs> here because we're we're barely we barely scratched FM. We haven't even gotten into linear sats, which is just a whole nother ball sure. of wax entirely. Uh, I, I'm I'm more than willing to come back. Oh, and you're, talk you're, about it if you want. You, you have to. You have to. At okay. this point, you're locked in. <laughs> this this is awesome. We're going to keep going, but um, man, th this is already. I hope everybody in the chat's really enjoying this because this has been fantastic. Sean, you are. 
you're hot on your feet with this topic. This is awesome. <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, as any as anybody uh, worth their salt would do, I want to make sure that I acknowledge a lot of people who taught me all of this stuff over of the course. years. You know, I, I learned from some of the best. Of course, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so we we talked a little bit about you know what radio you might want to choose, what antennas you might want to choose, recording. You know, have an inline recorder. It sounds kind of like meh, but makes a lot of sense. You can't pull out your pencil and paper and log or try and switch to ham log on your iPhone. Too complicated I, to do I, that. I, I, I know people who do, and I don't sure. know how they do it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for me, simplicity, ease of operation, you know, just record the past. All right. So, man, we, we hit a lot of spots without diving into linear. I don't know that we got the time to dive into linear, though. Uh, why don't we talk about roving? Oh, perfect, perfect. And in fact, we haven't watched your video yet. That's you roving, right? That is me roving. That's okay. Correct. Do you want to give a little, give them a little bit of info before we dive into this? Sure. One? So, so part of the allure of of satellite operating, as we've already talked about, is that it's uh, it's extremely portable, and uh, you know, small station can do wonders uh, 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 in a very portable uh, package. So. One of the things that is very uh, prominent in the satellite community is, remember we were talking earlier about grid squares. And uh, there are lots of people who collect contacts with as many different grid squares as they can possibly get, uh, just like some people try to earn their Worked All States Award or DXCC, for example. The satellite community and the VHF UHF community try to work as many different grid squares as they can. And some of these grid squares in, uh, I'm focusing here on the continental United States. There are right. grid squares, you know, grid squares are all around the world, but I'm mm -hmm. focusing specifically on the continental US. Um, so uh, there are, there is a, an active community of uh, people who will go and transmit from some of the rarer grid squares in the continental United States, uh, uh, specifically for the purpose of putting them on the air for the amateur radio satellite community. And that mm -hmm. is known as roving. And um, there are uh, several um, high profile rovers that are here with us tonight. Uh, I, I saw that AD0HJ was in the room a little bit earlier. Uh, Doug N6UA is another rover. Um, so part of the allure for them is not just trying to talk to as many of these grid squares in the continental United States as possible, but they wanna see how many different grid squares they can actually transmit from. And uh, that, there's a separate award for that as well. Uh, so I, I have gotten bitten by the, um, uh, by the roving bug myself. And in July, uh, I did a rove of 12 different grid squares throughout Missouri and Iowa uh, in five days. And some of them were pretty rare. So um, that, you know, for me, uh, you know, I've been on HF expeditions and I've been on contest expeditions and stuff like that. So for me, being able to go on a D expedition that doesn't cost a couple of thousand bucks and just throw gear into my car and go to a rare grid square that's, you know, two or 300 miles uh, down the road is a lot less expensive. And um, it gives you, it uh, gives a lot of people the opportunity to be the rare station uh, in this, in the satellite community. And it's you're almost like a, fun. you're almost kind of like a D expedition of grid squares. Absolutely. That's I mean, that's exactly kind of what, what it is, is right? Yep, and, and that is exactly what it is. So I, I'm I'm throwing I'm throwing up your picture of the grid squares now. Okay. And so, so I'm, I'm I'm looking at my second monitor. So yeah. there are two there are two images that you're toggling back and forth with. Uh, if it's possible to hold on one for a minute, that would be great. Um, the one so right there, the one that we're looking at now. Um, okay, hold on. How is, do I? Okay. <laughs> See, I, I tried will, to do this in a slideshow. You know, this is, we'll just make it super long uh, delay. Let's okay. see how that works. So Sorry, it's going to so, flop on you really quick. Okay, we should be good. Okay, so that map right there, that is a map of all of the uh, grid squares that I have personally contacted since moving back to central Illinois in wow. June of 2019. So that's a little over a year's worth. All of via work. satellite. All via satellite. All okay. of those are satellites. The the green squares are ones that I have uh, confirmed the contact through Logbook of the World. The um, the blue ones are are grids that I have confirmed with a QSL card, and the orange ones are uh, grids that I have talked to, uh, but have not confirmed yet. And uh -huh. right now I'm at like I'm at like just over half of the of the grids in the continental United States that I've worked or confirmed. That's great. Um, this uh, this particular page that you just brought up. 
This is a map of the relative rarity of all of the 488 grid squares in the continental United States. And that is run, uh, that is administered by uh, a guy named uh, Paul, KE0PBR. And this is called the Gridmaster Heat Map. And you can follow Gridmaster Heat on Twitter to get uh, an update of this map every week. And this is all crowdsourced information. So um, everybody who uh, is an active satellite operator reports their the status of how many grids they have worked, which grids they have worked, and sends all of that data to uh, to Paul. And Paul tabulates all of that info and uh, gives a relative heat map of the rarity of uh, certain grids. So on that map that we saw, the the green grids are extremely common. A lot, you know, most of the people who are sending in data have worked that grid, and it you know it 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 goes. Um, uh, it, it, it goes in color all the way down to red, and a bright red grid is super, super rare, and not that many people have talked to it. So there's a grid in Texas that's red. Why have you not that blown actually, that up? I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought that up because that is that is a super, super rare grid square. It's DL88, and it is it is there's just a, a sliver of land in South Texas yeah. that is part of that uh, in the uh, Big Bend National Monument, and uh, there that actually that grid is going to be activated on October 25th by. Um, uh, by N6UA, who is here in the in this, uh, oh, in cool. this session, he's going to go to DL88 and put it on the air for a day, along with um, uh, AD0DX uh, out of Colorado. So um, those two guys are going to go and uh, transmit from probably uh, the rarest grid square in the continental United States, and that's coming up on October 25th. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, this is literally the way you're talking is like, I mean, this is de-expedition talk. Like this is totally the excitement totally. That, that you get from like, oh, we're going to go make this happen. We're going to yep. we're going to activate this super rare location that people have been itching for. Yep. And there's a and, OK. Uh, so again, so what was that Twitter? So the Twitter, the heat map? Oh, Twitter? The Twitter is is grid master heat. <laughs> I like master it. heat. I like it. Um, so follow that. Uh, follow that on Twitter, and uh, and that will give you information on uh, on uh, all sorts of uh, uh, of data on which grid squares in the continental United States are the rarest. You That's might be cool. surprised. You might be. You might live in a really really rare grid. You might live right next to a really rare grid. Well, <laughs> maybe no, maybe. And I, I won't. <laughs> I don't either. I don't either. There's like there's like eight satellite operators in my grid squares. So right right right. Work this one. But um, something else to keep in mind if you're interested in trying to see how many grid squares you can collect is that. AMSAT maintains a page on their website of uh, of updated uh, announcements for satellite grid expeditions, and uh, I think Paul uh, KE zero PBR maintains that page as well. So Paul is your go to guy for uh, grid rarity and mm -hmm. grid activation information. Is so, that like a Paps Blue Ribbon thing? PBR Paps Blue Ribbon. Uh, I believe it is. Yeah. <laughs> is it really? Oh man! <laughs> wow! Double cheers yeah. then. Uh, great. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, so yeah, uh, trying to uh, trying to get in the grid chase and see how many different grids you can uh, you can work on a satellite or transmit from if you're interested in roving mm -hmm. uh, is is a tremendous amount of fun. Oh man, that's super cool. Oh, I love this. I love it. Um, okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna play the video of Sean okay. uh, working a rover. Is that what they call it? You're working a rover. Or I, am, what are we... I, I am I am roving. You're roving. See, I, yep. I sound like an idiot already. I'm not even using the lingo correctly. Uh, we're going to play the video, and then, you know, we'll take some questions. But we're, we're pretty much, you know, at the top of the hour here for, uh, for going forward. Because we do want you guys to join us on Discord. Uh, Sean didn't know this because we were working out some issues, mainly on my end, before the live stream. So I'm going to try and cajole him to joining us on Discord as well. We'll see how that goes. Maybe he's got the time. I don't know. I don't know. But... I'm throwing this at him live, so you know that he's got a lot of peer pressure now. So we're Ooh, throwing pressure. The <laughs> Let's watch the video. So here we and, and you can you can narrate this live as, as we're going along. But, oh, I'm just but, I'm just gonna let it roll. Let, okay. me, let me set it up. Let me set mm -hmm. it up though. Mm -hmm. So um, so this is an FM satellite pass. Uh, this is only a, like a, a minute of it, and uh, I'm using uh, the arrow antenna. I'm using my Kenwood THD72. Uh, and the recording you are hearing is coming directly out of the uh, out of the audio from uh, from the receiver on the D72. This is from uh, the grid square EN40, which is uh, in East Central Iowa. It's not super super rare like the one that uh, that Doug and Ron are going to uh, next weekend, 
but uh, it's rare enough that a lot of people needed it. So I was pretty popular on this pass. And you're going to hear me working, uh, guys, in rapid fire succession. So uh, this is this is an example of what can happen on an FM satellite when somebody pops up from a rare grid. Very good. Uh, Sean Bear on the Super Chat says, I live right next to a couple that Sean doesn't have yet. I could possibly be persuaded for a small fee to take up satellite we work. Laugh out loud. Talk. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> so, all right, here we go. Let, let's watch this happen. Here we go. Hopefully it's good. It's not really exciting without the audio. It's no, I know. Some, yeah. Some old dude standing in a cornfield. Right, right, right. So hold on one second. Let me. You got to You got to love that. This is also one of those things we did right before the. Uh, right before we went live. Where did I put that video? There you are. Video loop. Um, well, we can do this the old fashioned way. That's what we'll do. We will um, just pull up the video and do the uh, display. Hold on one second. We can definitely hear that, so hold on. All right, we're almost there. So this is something that, you know, any any satellite operator can do this. This is not um, this is not anything that uh, requires a tremendous feat. You know, all, mm -hmm. all it needs is for you to be able to throw an HT and a, and a you know, or a small pack go. of gear into your car and, uh, and an antenna and, you know, you're off to the oh, race. Oh, wow. Here we go. Fantastic. We have to talk about something because we didn't talk about it um, on the on the show earlier. And that okay. reminded me. Explain why you're twisting your wrist. Oh, yes. OK. So very important. Very, very important. Yes. This is important. Yes. So as a satellite is passing overhead. So basically, you know, let's let's talk about what is going on in space uh, while, you know, when a satellite pass is occurring. So basically you're talking about a really small box that has uh, a little vertical antenna sticking out of it and it's orbiting you know 17,000 miles an hour 500 kilometers above the sky but as it's orbiting it's not in a stationary position it's twisting and tumbling and and doing the things that things in space do with zero gravity so it's rotating all over the place that means that the orientation of the antenna on the satellite is constantly shifting so if you had an antenna that was in a fixed position, say, for example, you had a, a, a vertically polarized antenna for your mm -hmm. receive antenna, right? It would work OK. But whenever the satellite tumbled and the position of the antenna on the satellite shifted, you would get fading because there's uh, there's a discrepancy in uh, the polarization of antennas on the UHF like bands. A it's like a it's three like or a, four it, dB drop, right? It's much more than that. It's Is about it? 20 dBs. Oh, so wow. It, yeah, it can it can be as much as 20 dB difference. So uh, if this if the satellite antenna is horizontal and your antenna is perfectly vertical, you're going to experience a 20 dB drop in receive signal rel uh, mm -hmm. until the uh, until the satellite antenna comes around back to vertical. So that is in the satellite world that is a phenomenon known as polarization fading because the polarization of the antennas mismatch. So in order to compensate for that you will you saw me in that video i'm constantly spinning my antenna trying to get my uh, receive antenna properly aligned with the orientation of the satellite antenna at that specific moment in time 
because it's constantly moving. So I'm constantly having to change the polarization of my antenna, which is why it is a huge advantage to hold your antenna in your hand rather than put it on a tripod mount because it allows you to much more quickly compensate for polarization phase. and that that's partially though because your antenna is, is horizontally polarized so you're you're twisting it to to maximize where it's the most effective on the receive side well well technically the antenna is polarized in the direction that i have at any given second sure so it's not yeah. Speci yeah it's not specifically vertical or horizontal it's whatever mm -hmm. direction i'm holding it at that exact moment in time so that that's and that's the whole point i don't want my antenna to be fixed vertical or horizontal i want to be able to adjust it very quickly right. to uh to tune in uh the maximum receive signal that i can which will tell me that my receive antenna is aligned with the satellite antenna itself it, it's probably also important to mention uh we watched the video with you holding the antenna mm -hmm. to to maximize the space of the boom you're holding the the elements are perpendicular to each other that's correct so that, you need uh, to twist them as you go just by nature of doing what you're doing i mean that that's kind of the nature of it right to, to be effective yes i mean there, there are plenty of people who uh operate satellites successfully by putting their antenna on a tripod and fixing it in one direction plenty of people make plenty of satellite contacts mm -hmm. that way um but if you're out roving uh, or you simply are, are operating portable somewhere and you want to maximize your efficiency, being able to compensate for that polarization fading in near real time is a huge operating advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got a, we got a comment here that I really liked, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll throw this out there. Dawn, uh, N5SKT, said, we have a guy in the club that comes out to field day every year for about 30 minutes, makes the satellite contact, and heads out. <laughs> He is so good. He gets them every time. It, it's like the uh, James Bond briefcase scene where you, you, you <laughs> open the briefcase and you, you put the it, it's five minutes of putting the, the, the gun together. Right. Yes. For, for a for a, you know, two minutes, something. And then you're you're out of there. You eat yourself. You be careful. Double oh seven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have all my toys. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. But I love that. I love that concept of like this very focused individual. who's like, I'm going to do this one thing and I'm going to do it very well. And that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, I've, I, I've been that guy. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, here's your 100 points. Got to go. Now, I will say, everything we've talked about today is just one super interesting aspect of amateur radio. That's why it's such a beautiful hobby. Yep. Yep. There's no reason why. You're, you're most of the way there, most of you. I bet you half of you probably have like a dozen Baofeng. So um, you, you probably can devote two of them to connect to a uh, to a you know, a Yagi antenna to make this work. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of applications for you to do this. It's a lot of fun. You know, reminders, uh, satellites aren't on your schedule. You're on their schedule. Sometimes that means, uh, have you set your alarm? How, how, how late have you stayed up and how early have you gotten up to do a satellite contact? I just got up to do a satellite pass at 1.40 in the morning last <laughs> weekend to work a really it. rare grid. I love it. I love it. I mean, that's, that. you know, if you, if you are interested in, uh, uh, working DX on HF, or if you're interested in collecting rare grid squares on satellite, you know, you show up whenever the operator is going to be there because you need that unit for your collection. Yeah. So, you know, a really interesting way to look at this too is, you know, for uh, summits on the air, we, we generally go out to the summit, we hike out there, we do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. In, in, in your case, you, you have people same kind of idea you're pursuing these interesting grid squares they're going to that location but you've got the extra co complexity of it's not about how long i hike up to a summit it's about how long until the pass is overhead and so you, you may have very few options in some cases for satellites you that's, can work that's true and uh you know um that's why uh, a lot of people who you know for i'll, I'll go back to the roving example mm -hmm. um you know, if you if a rover is going to go to a super rare grid square and activate it, you know, hopefully they'll be able to stick around for a few hours because that gives them more satellites to work because, you know, there are about roughly two dozen satellites. If you include the sideband and CW satellites as well, there's about two dozen that you can uh, work on uh, on any given day. And, you know, the 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 times that uh, any given satellite is overhead. Uh, shifts constantly because the orbit isn't perfect. So, mm -hmm. you know, every day the satellite moves forward on the on the calendar, you know, like 
three or four minutes. So, you know, over the course of, the, of a month, you know, the operating times of a satellite at the beginning of the month are going to be, you know, a couple of hours off compared to where they were uh, to where they are at the end of the month. So um, sometimes, you know, sometimes satellite passes, you know, the, the best pass that you could possibly hope for uh, might occur at three o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, if, if you're serious about it, then you're going to get up and you're going to work it. And that's kind of what it, you know, that that's kind of what it's all about is it's, it's being serious and interested in the aspects of it that it, it's a fast paced part of the hobby that right. again, you know, how we started this whole thing off, you got your technician, boom, you can start doing this right now. You can start doing Absolutely. this right now, and it's a it's a fantastically fun, very fast paced part of ham radio. I I would argue that for, you know, minute for minute, it's probably the most intense ham radio that you can experience. Uh, that it's, that from my from my you know from what I've experienced, it's 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 remarkably fun, and uh, you know, as with anything else, you know, you don't have to jump in to uh this particular facet of the hobby uh you know you don't have to go into the deep end of the pool right off the bat you know mm -hmm. if, if if getting up for a satellite pass at three in the morning sounds stupid to you then don't do it you know yeah. uh but if uh you know uh you can start off small you can uh you can uh cut your teeth uh doing uh, uh easier passes um there are uh, plenty of things that you can do uh with the satellite pass to uh to get uh more skill and, and uh, technical ability under your belt without uh, having to try to work every single rare grid square that pops up every month. Right. So, um, you know, start slow, ask a lot of questions, uh, work on refining your station. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of satellite operators out there and there's probably one in your neck of the woods that you can lean on for uh, a little Elmering and getting some uh, some uh, some assistance in getting your 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 satellite package set up. Mm -hmm. If all else fails and there's nobody else you can talk to, you can go to the uh, On All Bands blog, uh, onallbands.com from DX Engineering. I've written several introductory articles there on satellite operating. We got the link in the description. Go check awesome. that out. Thank you. And yep. uh, you know, if if anybody has a question, send me an email or you know, follow me on Twitter. I'd be happy to help you out. Uh, Sean, this has been <laughs> this has been one of the best interviews we've done in a long time. Oh man, this has thank been you. Amazing. We have to have you back because, and and we could just we could just say it. We have a whole list of things we wanted to talk about. There's no <laughs> way. I, I tell people, I, I say an hour flies by so quickly. We're already 15 past the hour, and I tried wow. to be fast to get to this interview portion of just talking through it. We want to talk about linear satellites. We want to talk about you know the any man home station for working satellites, right? I yep. mean, you've been yep. working in that area. Um, this is just awesome. Here's what I want to do, um, Sean. I I did not, and, and I'm throwing at the I'm throwing this to you live, and I hate. I, it, we, we literally were doing troubleshooting beforehand and messing around, and I should have brought this up earlier, but I slipped. It slipped my mind. The Discord, the link is in the description for the Discord. I sent the link to Sean for the Discord. We do an after chat there, and it's a voice chat. You don't have to be on video or anything like that. And uh, we generally, ask, you know, people in the chat room ask questions. If okay. you've got time, um, I sent you the link on the Zoom. I apologize. I'm doing this in the open like this. It sucks. <laughs> I, I I hate. I I've never had to do this before because it was just so fast into into doing it. I super apologize. But if you're down for it, uh, hop hop on over to the Discord, and yeah, uh, I'm down. Sure, go, let's go, go down. Yeah, go ahead and click the link. I, could you see it in the chat room on the Zoom side? Uh, let me here. I got to minimize the YouTube chat. Uh, yeah, sure, I got it. So just join us over there, and uh, okay. I'll, uh, you know, if, if you have any trouble, just email me and. Um, hop down to the live stream chat and there'll be a, a text chat and a voice chat it's just voice you just got to sort out your voice and that's it man this has been fantastic so i'm gonna i'm gonna do my little wrap-up thing sean if you want to actually hang on i'll walk you through we'll do the discord thing live i'm gonna mute you for a second can you hang out is that cool absolutely hey thanks a lot for having me this was yeah, a please. lot of fun uh, and, you know I'll, I'll 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 port over to uh discord and we'll continue the conversation but, there but let's is there anything you need to mention anywhere i mean we've got your twitter is probably the best place for you but, but where else should you know you did the d expedition or sorry dx engineering videos link to that you had episode one come out great work that's just the primer yeah, so, you're gonna dive deeper than that i know right i, I spent all day so so I, i've started a new video series on uh on getting started on 
on the uh, amateur radio satellites for DX uh, engineering. I just uh, put, they just posted the first video in that series on Friday. You can find it on uh, DX engineering's YouTube channel. And uh, I spent all day today uh, working on the next episode, which is getting started in FM satellites. So look for that episode in a couple of weeks. That's awesome. And everything that Sean sent me is in the description, but please do follow him. And, and I, we didn't mention this, but it, it popped in my mind just now. Uh, AMSAT's Twitter channel or Twitter whatever account, they post a lot of updates for uh, – that's where they cover certain modes of satellites at Switch, right? That's correct. Uh, yeah. So if you if you're interested in in uh, good real time information about the health and welfare of various satellites uh, that are in orbit, I strongly recommend you follow AMSAT's Twitter feed. At uh, it's it's at AMSAT, and mm -hmm. uh, they are very very good about keeping the the satellite community up to date with what's going on uh, with the the current health of various satellites that are that are up there. Yeah, that's awesome, Sean. Uh, fantastic. You, Thank you so much for coming out here. This was just awesome. Oh, my uh, so pleasure. Hang, hang tight. I'm going to mute you for a little bit. I got to wrap up because, uh, again, the the reason why we did this episode was because of the, the patrons. On Patreon.com, I, I put a vote out there, and I take, uh, you know, whatever you guys show topics you want. You hit me with a show topic that I'm not really at all an expert in. I can tell you what to go buy, but I'm not going to tell you – effectively how to operate in that space and i actually sean was 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 recommended to me to to reach out to him i had already been following him and, and had been watching his stuff for a while and i was like oh yeah i could just do that i could just email people in in the ham radio space and he was super fast and replying to me we worked it out it was this is awesome i hope this was worth the wait for the patrons i really appreciate sean's time and uh you know and all the support of of the patrons out there so without further ado thank you to all the patrons uh we have just you know across the board the the support i get in continuing to do, do the channel is just immense hopefully <laughs> this is you know some kind of value in in, in that whole uh, patreon thing but a uh, big shout out to the producers, obviously the brew crew, and then every other patron that, that's out there. I, I super appreciate, you know, all the support and all that. Uh, so next week I'm going to be in a um, undisclosed location. I will be doing some antenna work. It may be an antenna shootout for portable antennas in the field. And uh, so, yeah, you think of your favorite portable antenna, and I probably have it, and I'm going to be bringing it with me, and we're going to be trying to do some live QSOs. Hopefully, we'll do some voice. We'll definitely be doing some digital, and it will likely all be on the 705. That's the radio I want to take out. So we're going to try and not just take out um, resonant antennas, but I'll, I'll be bringing out my... I love my QRP pocket tuner. It's a manual tuner, but works really well. So we might just be working off of that in some cases. So it, it should be a lot of fun. I, I, I will I will provide more information. It, it will be a, uh, a really interesting, fun video, hopefully, live stream. And then all the videos that I come out from, from that uh, vacation trip. I haven't vacationed since the human malware virus, like, kicked off uh, this year. So it's going to be a lot of fun to, to get out with the family and actually do something. We're not doing anything far. I'm literally like a couple hours from my house, but regardless. Mm. Man, so I will say again, big thank you to Sean. We're going to sort out all the uh, the Discord fun. I hope you join us out there. The link is in the description for Discord. Just scroll past that and all the admins. Uh, you got Zach. Uh, Matt, I saw you, by the way. Thank you so much. I think I saw Evan and was Ethan in there too? Might have been anyway i i really appreciate everybody coming out thank you so much for that and we will we will wrap things up here shortly oh we've already we've already rolled it so all right i gotta do that i gotta let it run a little bit longer because youtube has been been nerfing me every time i end the stream too early so i'm gonna wrap it up right now thank you so much i'll talk to you later 73